working with staff. Commissioners, thank you for your time as well. <clears throat> for each case, there will be a public hearing. We ask that the applicant keep their presentation to under 10 minutes. They may reserve two minutes as a rebuttal. We ask that the public keep their comments to two minutes unless they have previously requested in writing four or five minutes as a representative of a group or organization. Pursuant to the provision of section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, notice is hereby given that a final hearing before this commission is appealable to the Chancery Court of Davidson County or the Circuit Court of Davidson County. This is statutory writ of certiorari. You are advised to seek your own independent, independent legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements are met. You should also seek independent legal advice regarding the applicability of the writ of certiorari to the specific decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. Items on the consent, consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. Robin, do we have any changes to our agenda? We do. The applicant for 2020 10th Avenue South has requested a deferral and the applicant for 929 Montrose has requested to be removed. 929 would be heard at the end of the meeting. Okay. Um, just as a reminder for ourselves that when there's a deferral that we can make a decision on that. Um, Robin, did 2020 10th Avenue give you a reason for deferral? They did not. Okay. All right. Robin has submitted the changes to the agenda. Are Move there approval. any questions? There is a motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. So we have approved the agenda. Are there any council members here? Okay, none so. Approval of the minutes of the January 16 meeting. Is there a motion? Any questions or a motion? Move for approval. Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Unanimous, thank you. Consent agenda. With the one case that was removed from the consent agenda that Ms. Sigler mentioned, there are 14 cases still on the consent agenda for today. Those are 422 Broadway, it's an application for signage, 302 Chapel Avenue, new construction addition and outbuilding, 411 Broadway, also signage, uh, 109 Second Avenue North, signage, 521 Fatherland Street, it's an outbuilding with a setback determination. Thank you. Oh, I have the remote here. Uh, 1726 Linden Avenue is an application for new construction with an addition. 1908 19th Avenue South, uh, that's new construction, an addition and outbuilding. 217 Lauderdale, oops, yeah. Uh, 217 Lauderdale Road, new construction of an addition. 3542 Richland Avenue, infill with setback determination. 1826 Wildwood Avenue is an application for infill. Uh, that's actually a case that was heard uh, last year, the year before um, permit expired and it's returning, revised. Um, 3714 Princeton Avenue is an applica application for new construction of an addition. 1911 Boscoville Street is new construction addition. 1824 4th Avenue North is new construction of an addition. And 1302 Calvin Avenue is new construction addition. Staff has reviewed these cases, uh, find that they all meet their respective guidelines. Staff recommends approval of the items on the consent agenda uh, with the applicable conditions and the staff recommendations finding that these applications meet the design guidelines for their respective overlays. Move approval of the consent agenda. There's a motion. There's a second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, it's unanimous. So overlay 
recommendation for Kenner Manor Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Thank you. So first I wanted to point out that the map is different than what was noticed. So initially the boundaries included the entirety of the National Register District, but now they only include Kenner Avenue. The National Park Service found the district eligible for the National Register of Historic Places under Criterion A of the National Register's criteria in the area of community planning and development and Criterion C for architecture. Kenner Manor is significant in the early suburbanization of Nashville as large land estates were subdivided into smaller tracts in the early 20th century. The Kenner Manor Historic District is representative of the transition between streetcar, streetcar suburbs and early automobile suburbs as a strictly grid patterned layout evolved to more curvilinear streets and larger lot sizes. The range of architectural styles and forms employed uh, within Kenner Manor um, represents the predominant trends in the early to mid 20th century, featuring the Craftsman, Colonial Revival, Tudor Revival, and English Cottage Revival styles. The most common house form uh, includes bungalow and minimal traditional houses. Kenner Manor retains a strong integrity of location, design, setting, materials, feeling, and association. Staff suggest a recommendation of approval for the overlay as the district meets Criterion 5 of Section 17.36.120 since the district is already listed in the National Register. Staff recommends adoption of the design guidelines since they meet the Secretary of Interior standards. They're very similar to all of the other neighborhood conservation zoning overlay guidelines, except for, of course, they have some details that are specific to the historic context in this neighborhood. Did you have any questions for me? And since the council member's not here, uh, it may be best just to go ahead and start with public comment. Okay. And if you would also um, give your name and your address, please, as you stand to speak um, for public hearing. Come forward. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Phil Thomason. I'm a board member of the Kenner Manor Neighborhood Association and reside at 118 Kenner Avenue. I'm speaking on behalf of the board, which is requesting that you approve a conservation district along Kenner Avenue. The criteria for becoming a conservation district <clears throat> include being a historic neighborhood and showing strong support by property owners, and we meet uh, both of those criteria. The Kenner Manor Historic District was listed in the National Register of Historic Places on March 22, 2016. The district includes Kenner Avenue, Woodmont Circle, Crestview Drive, and Crescent Road. Within the district are 187 properties, of which 145 are contributing to the character of the district. Our streets primarily display Tudor Revival, Colonial Revival, and bungalow-style houses. The district has its origins from the Kenner Manor subdivision of 1916, which developed Kenner Avenue and Woodmont Circle, and most of the dwellings along these two streets were built in the 1920s. The Clearview subdivision was platted in 1929 and includes Clearview Drive and Crescent Road, and most of the houses on these two streets were constructed in the 1930s to the 1950s. Since our neighborhood was listed as a historic district, we have had numerous discussions about how best to preserve our neighborhood's architectural character while at the same time accommodating compatible new development. We have discussed rezoning, a contextual overlay, and conservation zoning. We have had extensive discussions of these options at our annual neighborhood meetings, informal conversations along each street, and talks among our neighbors. What came from those discussions was interest throughout the neighborhood in conservation zoning. And several months ago, we requested that Councilwoman Kathleen Murphy assist us in holding neighborhood meetings and conduct a survey to assess support. The board members went door to door with a petition to gather signatures expressing support or opposition to the proposed overlay. Councilwoman Murphy had an online survey, and the board also sent letters to those who owned rental property but lived outside of Nashville. We had initially proposed conservation zoning for the entire neighborhood, but there are sufficient numbers of residents along Woodmont Circle, Crestview Drive, and Crescent Road who felt that a contextual overlay may work better for their streets. So this area was not included in the final conservation district. 
we plan to have more discussions about uh, a con contextual overlay on these streets uh, later this year. The Conservation District, the board is asking you to approve, includes Kenner Avenue, and along the street are 85 primary dwellings, of which 72 are considered contributing to the character of our historic district. Our street is remarkably consistent in its front and side yard setbacks, similar heights, and almost all the properties are of brick construction. Most were built between 1920 and 1930. My house is typical and was built in 1926, for which the first owner paid $7,900. I paid a little more than that. Uh, the property owners along Kenner Avenue value the architectural character of the street, and over 80% of those who filled out the petition or the online survey support the conservation district. One of the reasons we have such high support is the concern over two recent incompatible construction projects on our street. We have several similar lots, and we want the conservation district so we can have your help in getting the most compatible infill possible. Our street has a unique character, and it continues to be a desirable place to live. Recent advertisements by realtors selling properties on the street have had the headline, Great Opportunity to Live on Coveted Kenner Avenue. I'm not sure coveted is the right word, but we know we have a great street. Most of the houses on Kenner Avenue will reach 100 years of age in this next decade. The Kenner Manor Neighborhood Association Board respectfully requests your approval of our conservation district so that our houses will serve Nashville residents for another 100 years. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Matthew Militich, and I live at 167 Kenner Avenue, and my wife and I are adamantly opposed to this overlay, primarily because we have infill property on Kenner Avenue, and there are just way too many restrictions for us to properly, properly utilize our property. Primarily, our house has been considered a teardown amongst three different realtors that we've had over to talk about what we should do to our house. We own a lot next door, and our existing house is right on the property line. And if we can't tear down our house under, under the rules of the overlay, then what are we gonna do? It's gonna cut into our, our value of our property. And that's why we're opposed. We live in an eclectic neighborhood. We don't live in a consistent neighborhood as been described. We have, I live next door to a zero lot line stucco house. I have a vinyl sided house next on the other side of me. We have apartments on our street. We have one story, nothing like what you're showing up there on the display, but anyway, very nervous. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from public? My name is Christine Modisher, and I'm the president of the Kenner Manor Neighborhood Association. Um, and I, I just wanted to reiterate what Mr. Thomason said. Um, the board, as in many other neighborhoods, the Kenner Manor board is concerned about preventing, preserving the unique character of our entire neighborhood, but especially uh, Kenner today, and protecting it from tall, skinny infill as well, there, as, well as other non-conforming uh, construction. We've been talking about this for a number of years, thanks uh, to the efforts of Phil Thomason and others. We are on the National Historic Register. We've had at least three community meetings with our city councilwoman. Uh, we have had um, house parties inviting neighbors to come and talk about this. We have gone door to door with a, with a petition um, and there is just overwhelming support as a general rule on Kenner for a preservation overlay. Uh, we are gonna be looking at a contextual overlay for the rest of the neighborhood to uh, add a measure of protection for that, but today we are here on the um, preservation overlay for Kenner. And we strongly feel that uh, this preservation overlay uh, will save the special character of the neighborhood that um, is precious to us and valuable to the neighbors, uh, but also the property values and uh, that acting now on Kenner um, would, is the thing to do and respectfully recommend that you approve it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Anyone else? Hey, my name is John Moran. Um, I live at 136 Kenner. I did an addition on my house in, uh, two years ago and did it in, within the guidelines of what we're presenting here, and I think it's definitely able to do. I mean, not everybody sits there and thinks of their neighbors when they're doing additions, and which you can tell by driving up and down our street, the big tall houses that are down there. So, you know, this just puts protection on us. Some people do it right, some people don't, and this is to protect the ones that don't do it right. So I, I vote for it. Thank you. Please come forward. If there's anyone else, just please get in line so that we can um, hear you clearly. Thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Adams, and uh, I own the property at 189 Kenner. And uh, our family's owned that property for close to 60 years. And uh, I guess I would like to start off by saying that... Uh, uh, the horse is already out of the barn. In fact, it's about near Memphis now. Looking at those houses there, that while they're aesthetically pleasing, that is not the subdivision that you see as you drive down Kenner. There are 40 houses, 40s houses, there's 50s, there's 60s, there's some have been constructed in the last few years. And so to try to get the genie back in the bottle is going to be impossible. So I think there's probably something else going on here as, as, as I would look at it from afar. I think that uh, it's more of a control issue. They don't want anybody else in there and the controls are so restrictive that it would keep anybody else from doing anything economically viable. As a gentleman said here a minute ago, uh, What's he going to do with this property? He's in a box now. He can't sell it. He can't do a reasonable construction project there because it would be way too costly. As we know, in the historic district, they ask you to leave the houses, the fronts, front of the houses up, and then they reconstruct it. So they, uh, and, and mostly, and they, I think also I noticed on the restrictions that it said, the uh, envelope would occur within uh, a story and a half. There is no way, no way you can put enough footage on a house like that to come up with the construction uh, cost and let it be economically uh, admissible. I have no intention Sir, of doing anything. your time is up. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, my name is Christopher Loss. I live at 131 Kenner Avenue with my wife and family. And I am here to speak in favor of the conservation overlay that has been proposed. And I want to simply make the point that while some of the homes in the Kenner Manor neighborhood are not contributing to the historic district, the vast majority are. And the guidelines that have been presented and the proposal that is on the table is intended to preserve the historic quality of our neighborhood and intended to control the growth and development that is ongoing in our city in order to preserve the unique architectural and neighborhood characteristics of Kenner Manor, Ave Kenner Manor and Kenner Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. We will close public hearing. Just want to thank your groups on your efforts and also your time. Okay. Um, do we have discussion now? Uh, Sarah, I just want to, again, just for public, is that this is really the first stop for this review. We do not... Um, our authority is, is limited, so you, you, it will be going to planning and then city council. So that's where the approval uh, process goes through. So thank you for being here to, to share your thoughts and uh, recommendations. I'll add to that and have a question for staff coming from this is that our, our charge is one to determine if the neighborhood meets the um, definition of to be 
um, have a conservation overlay applied to it and to if the uh, or the guidelines appropriate and meet the Secretary of Interior standards often anytime it comes to property rights there's opinions on both sides and, and this is a forum with which those will be heard but our, our, our charge again is to decide those two things not necessarily to win contests about what's right and what's wrong uh, in terms of property rights to that end um, in the presentation, there was um, 85 properties that were designated within this um, district, and 72 of those were deemed contributing. Has the staff verified that? Is that an accurate statement? Thank you. Can I, may I ask one of the presenters a question? I think the public hearing is canceled. Did you want to? Okay. Well, I was just I was just curious. Mr. Tomlinson said that. 80% of the people who were um, polled returned in a favorable, favorable uh, to this zoning overlay, and I was just curious about how many people that entailed of the 72% contributing properties or the 85 total. That's about two thirds of the owner occupied uh, houses on Kenner. Okay. We, we really have very little feedback from uh, people who own rental property. Just a, a few responses. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other comments, or is there a motion to approve recommendation? Madam Chair, with respect to the Kidder Manor Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay, I move approval, finding that the um, vast majority of structures within the district, as defined in the application, um, are contributing and that the guidelines, uh, after review of the guidelines, that they meet the Secretary of Interior standards. Mm -hmm. There is a motion, there's a second, all in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. This proposal is to remove the top floor windows and replace them with pushed back wall and roll up doors at 128 Second Avenue North. The windows are not historic, so replacement is appropriate, but the overall plan does not meet the guidelines. The project does not meet section H3 through 6 for the design and configuration of the proposed replacement windows. The proposed windows do not replicate original windows or a style that is appropriate to the historic building style and period. A photograph from the early 1900s shows that the building had industrial steel windows. Windows like those on the right that you see down the street would be appropriate. The project does not meet section five, which states that steel windows should be replaced with steel or aluminum window designs that replicate the appearance of the original windows. Typically, these industrial windows were fixed windows with a central light or a collection of about four lights, creating a larger square that was operable as a hopper or an awning type of window. A roll-up window or door would mean that the entirety of the opening would be open rather than just a central portion, and no part of the window would remain visible. With historic windows, because the design was a hopper awning type on those industrial types, the open portion of the window remained fully visible when open. In, this, in these two images, you can see how losing the entire window creates a big gaping hole in the building. In addition, the proposal locates the windows three feet back from the exterior wall with a partial covering of a railing, both design features that do not mimic historic conditions. The project does not meet section H9, which states that window grills and balcony rails are not appropriate window treatments. A balcony type of railing is proposed for this project. Pushing back the windows three feet from the exterior of the historic wall does not meet section I for walls as it does not retain the original plane and creates a recess where one did not exist historically. Section I1 requires that the original walls, including plane and opening, should be retained. Pushing back the windows and adding the railings, again, creates a balcony which does not meet section I2, which states that balconies should not be added to public facades. Historically, it appears that the steel windows of the top floor were continuous and did not have areas of wall between them. Staff finds the introduction of this section of wall is inappropriate as it will effectively change the dimension of the windows within the historic masonry openings. The project does not meet section J for materials. The recommendation is consistent with past decisions. In 2016, the commission approved a request for multiple roll-up window doors at 105 Broadway. 
One roll-up door was approved as it was in the same general location as a historic roll-up door, but all the others were disapproved. The decision was appealed and court upheld the commission's decision. Roll-up doors have not been approved on new, have been approved on new construction, such as rooftops or rear additions, but not as replacement windows on historic buildings. There are similar conditions in terms of the lack of windows and openings with a pushback interior at 145 2nd Avenue North. However, that's a violation. That work was done without a permit. And there's the same at 166 2nd Avenue North. However, that's a condition that uh, predates the overlay. Staff recommends disapproval, finding that the proposal does not meet sections H, um, sections I, and sections J for wall alterations, um, replacement windows, and replacement materials. Did you have any questions of me? Not yet. Yes, uh, so the, from the, arc in our packet from the architect's um, drawings, he's included on the last page, the Buffalo Billiards, that's the one you're saying was done before the overlay, right. that he's included as an example. Right. Thank you. Is the applicant here? Now you make that sound so bad. <laughs> I know. Manuel Zeitlin, architect, uh, 516 Hagen Street. The, Robin, the, I think the one you quoted was 166, was the one that was done before. We also had 154 Second Avenue, which shows recessed. And that's the that, violation. That's more, okay, so they're both, okay. So, um, obviously this, the, I don't know if you have a photograph of the existing conditions of the building. Back up. Oh, there it is, that's it, yeah, that was it. So I think just sort of taking the different pieces, the second floor already has recessed openings that were there before we did, I think, the last bit of work on the building. The third floor, the top floor is the floor we're talking about. You, you mentioned the window, the original window went all the way across, but at some point that brick was at it. It looks like, it looks like it's been there for you know, quite a while, so you know, if, if we need to take that back out, that's not a problem, but it seems to make sense to keep it. Um, so we're really just looking for a solution to get to the owner's interest in having that ability to open up that top floor similar to the second floor. Um, I don't think they'd be opposed to bringing that opening, the windows closer you know, to the back facade. Right now we're showing a three foot recess so they could have a small outdoor terrace, but if we did something similar to the second floor where you had a glass rail up at the, or iron rail, steel rail up at the um, exterior wall, basically creating sort of a Juliet balcony that when the doors are open, then you've got um, a balcony, but when they're closed, you don't have a recess creating that shadow line. Either, either way would be okay with us. I think we've shown the existing windows on the top floor are already divided, and then the, the, the doors that we were proposing are actually way more divided than that, so we're trying to get close towards that, to that approximation of the historic steel windows, even though it's not a steel window. Um, we like the idea of the garage door, so you could completely open it. We'd be open to more of a folding door if that, that met with it, so it's kind of, I guess, putting it back in, in your hands in terms of direction on, on what would be acceptable to the board. Um, do you have questions for the applicant? I just had a question, Qu question clarification. No. You're on. Well, I think now I am. <laughs> Sorry. Um, when Robin was talking about the piece that to be removed, I don't think she meant this piece between the two larger windows. You meant the the hardy piece that's called out between the new proposal, not the existing. Oh, I see. Okay, that's yeah. There. Just, be, to, yeah. just to clarify. Yeah, we wouldn't have a problem with that. I, it sounds to me as if Mr. Uh, Zeitlin would like to um, work with staff on the windows and it, should we defer it so he has an opportunity to work with staff and staff can make a recommendation on... on um, That's up to you. I will say that we have been talking with them for at least two years. <laughs> so we haven't found anything. We, they haven't proposed anything yet that would work and we don't have anything to recommend that would completely open up that second, that top level because it just doesn't meet the guidelines. Yeah, so, that, so I think the conversation 
my understanding from Mark Bixler our office is that Robin said staff really couldn't approve anything that would have, a, that would have the ability to open that up because it, uh, anything, any, you know, that there wasn't like a compromise that needed to come before the board. So, if, you know, maybe the architects on the board could, might be able to word it in such a way that we could get to something that would work. Um, you know, I would suggest maybe moving, you know, moving the, moving the doors, the garage doors forward so they're right behind the railing at the exterior wall that we eliminate those hardy, hardy plank sections in the middle and let the windows, let it be a, a, just a vertical mullion that matches the windows as a divider instead of a wider separation. Um, We might have more questions for you later. Okay, Let sure. us have discussion. Right. Someone open public hearing, close public hearing, unless you're here to speak, <laughs> okay? Close public hearing and we can have some discussion. Um, let me just have some clarification. On these windows, uh, these openings, not windows, but the openings, um, is this Robin's or whose his project is this again? Is it Robin's, mm -hmm. is your project? Um, that was done prior to the overlay, yes. correct? Okay, so applicant is asking for the same kind of application? Right, it, the, there were roll-up doors on that second level previously and then they were replaced without a permit. Th this applicant had nothing to do with that. That's just before. And um, so those have roll-up doors? Yes, that's why you have that big mm -hmm. blank open. Totally so clarify. just because, you know, it was existing doesn't mean it meets the guidelines. Right. Um, what they're asking now is to do the same thing at the top of the floor, and we just didn't see any way opening up any of the levels would meet the guidelines. And because that was done prior, that doesn't mean that we would require that of those, those openings today. That that what that happened back years ago, pre-existing. Pre we would not have any purview on that. We, we yeah, they're not asking for anything about that changes or anything. Okay, okay, just to have some clarification. Robin, are there any uh, windows that are approved that you can open? Not for you know it, for an upper level, they were usually punched windows, and they open like a double hung would open or there are the industrial windows that have like a hopper or awning section to it. I don't know of any historic windows that completely just open up so that they disappear and leave right. a big gaping hole. But you can, open. you can put windows in that meet the guidelines that will open. open. Yes. Okay. And was that an example where Nashville plays? Is that a correct example? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. Which is, mm -hmm, they do, there's sections that open. Um, if you'll look at that. Yeah. This was a matter of the record. I don't think I'm, staff can correct me, but we did have an application that would replicate a double hung divided light scenario that sort of hinged at the middle um, that was reviewed and not approved for a facade along Broadway just as a matter of, there was some questions about will a window uh, open in its entirety and that was replicating I think the look of a wood window um, to kind of take the casing and the frame and just sort of flip the whole thing out so that it would be more open. And I think it was at the two-third point of the window, um, which just didn't really meet the, the nature of a window. Uh, I think, uh, I don't remember exactly the discussion, but certainly I, that was not something that was approved, um, but that did maybe meet the notion of a an opening that had a window in it that would then just be completely sort of open if you will, as opposed to a traditional double hung or the hopper style windows. Hey, any continued discussion? I mean, just um, since Manuel kind of asked for uh, just more of what we're thinking on this, I mean, so add issue to me after reading this and, and seeing the, you know, number one, there are existing windows currently that they now want to change to roll up doors, which isn't allowed under the guidelines. Number two, if you do a roll-up door, the second problem is if you do a roll-up door as example of the previously done work before the guidelines, it just creates, when they're open, it's just two huge holes in the facade. Third, 
if you push it back and create essentially a balcony, you know, if you push it back and, you know, again, you're changing that entire facade up front where there's no visible windows. It's just, again, an opening, even though it's just three feet back, it's still an opening and not a facade as it is and as it was historically. So those are the three things that I just don't think you can get over. Um, I can't get over for um, this application. And, you know, replacing windows is fine, but replacing them with what's essentially just doors or, and a balcony is um, that's something I can't approve. I think um, I'll, I'll, okay, well, I don't have anything to say and contrary to that. I, I feel like opening, uh, well, the first floor is an example of moving sort of away significantly from something that is um, in keeping and, and, and keeping the building in, in a contributing um, state in terms of dealing with openings. Um, and I think there's been lots of um, deliberation um, or it sees lots of applications and maybe not a whole lot of de deliberation about the appropriateness of a roll-up door as a, as a replacement, um, notwithstanding applicants and, and party goers and bachelorettes and whoever else comes comes to various establishments, establishments desiring that um, and having a good time in, in um, downtown and in this entertainment corridor. I, it, it, we're we're charged with keeping as keepers of the of the facades and keepers of the building. So. I'll, I'll, I'll echo your thoughts as well. So with, and if there's no other comments, I mean, with that, I'll, um, and, and regarding 128 Second Avenue North, I move for disapproval, um, agreeing with staff recommendations. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. All in favor of the motion. Aye. 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 Are there any unoppo opposed? None opposed. The motion carries. <clears throat> okay, we're on to 1808 Lillian Street. It is a circa 1910 hipped roof folk Victorian house that contributes to the historic character of the Lachlan Springs East End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. The application is for a rear addition and a garage. The addition and the garage meet the required setbacks. Staff finds that the overall height and scale of the addition to be appropriate, um, and for the garage as well. We find the overall scale in and of themselves of the addition and the garage to be appropriate, but their combined sizes together do not allow for the 20 feet of separation between the back of the addition and the garage, which is what um, the commission typically requires. Um, Staff has, I'm sorry, the commission has reduced this, uh, the 20 foot of space um, for requirement between the back of the addition and the garage. Um, in some cases, but that's usually when there have been unusual lot constraints, like an unusually deep front setback, an unusually shallow or shaped lot, extreme slope changes, or other easements. Staff cannot find any unusual constraints on this lot or any reason why the applicant should not be required to meet the 20 foot distance between the back of the house and the garage. Therefore, staff recommends that this addition and the garage be reconfigured so that there is the minimum distance of 20 feet between the two structures. Here is the first floor plan. The addition is inset appropriately. At the back corner, it is inset two feet, but later steps back, back out to be one foot um, on the, I guess that's on the um, right-hand side. Um, on both sides, it steps back, steps in for two feet. There's a channel and then steps back at, out, but the entire addition will always be at least one foot on the ground floor inset from the back corners. Um, and then here is the second floor plan. The entire second floor plan, or the entire second level is inset a minimum of two feet from the back corners and most of it is inset a full three feet. Here is the front facade. Um, the dormers seen in this view are on the addition and they are set back three feet from the historic house's side walls. So staff therefore finds their scale to be appropriate. Here is the left side facade. Staff appreciates that the applicant is keeping the height of the um, addition lower than that of the historic house. Staff finds the two-story portion with a 19-foot eave on this facade to be appropriate for two reasons. First, there's only one section that is two stories in form um, and is only 19, it is practically, uh, 
sorry, uh, is approximately eight foot two feet deep. Also, this taller kind of, it's, it's a stairwell, uh, is inset the full two feet. Um, so because it's not that deep and it's inset, staff finds that two-story portion to be appropriate. Um, the staff is, uh, I'm sorry, the applicant is proposing some changes to the window openings on the back of the historic house, uh, which MHCC considers to be partial demolition. At the very back of the house, the applicant intends to retain the existing wood window, but move it further towards the front of the house by about 18 inches. Um, staff finds this to be appropriate since both the window and the opening size will remain, uh, and um, the change is also towards the back. Also on the left facade, the applicant intends to keep the window closest to the front of the house, but remove the paired windows towards the back. The window opening will remain the same size, but casement windows will be installed in order to provide egress to the bedroom. Just a reminder that in a conservation overlay like Lachlan Springs, we don't technically review the replacement of the sashes so long as the window opening is remaining as is, which is what they're proposing here. Uh, but staff is offering to work with the applicant to see if there's a way, because those are such really great diamond patterned windows, um, or to, you know, to work with the applicant to find a way to see if we can work with the fire marshal or whatever to see if we can keep those windows and um, meet the egress and the fire code. Here's the right side facade. The applicant is proposing to remove a window opening on the right facade. The window is all the way back at the, uh, at the back of the historic house under a shed roof form um, that is different than the main form of the house. Staff finds the removal of this window opening is acceptable because it's located all the way at the back of the house um, and is not highly visible from the street. And then here are the drawings for the garage. It's just a garage. There's not really any upstairs space. It's one story, two bays wide. Again, the um, staff is finding that the scale and design of the, both the addition and the garage are appropriate in and of themselves, but together, because they don't allow for that 20 feet of separation, um, staff is asking that they be reconfigured to allow for that 20 feet of separation. So in conclusion, staff recommends approval with the following conditions. Staff approve the windows and doors, um, that the siding reveal uh, be a maximum of five inches, I think it's drawn at eight. There be a minimum distance between 20 feet between the back of the addition and the garage. Staff approve the roof color um, and shingle color of the addition and outbuilding and the location of the HVAC. With these conditions, staff finds that the proposed addition and outbuilding meet section 2B of the Lachlan Springs East End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay Design Guidelines. Questions to Melissa? Melissa, to meet the 20 feet, it looks like on the survey they're showing 14 and a half yes. feet. Um, obviously, it's up to the applicant to, to, meet, to meet the request. Um, it's a 24-foot deep garage, so I don't know. Maybe there's something to give there. Um, so there's a question in here, which is if the configuration of the house changes and they still have the inset, I know there was um, one of the reasons or given that the two-story form was acceptable was that it sort of was set in from right. the house. If you take the house and sort of go... And then do that. Right. Is that um, they're, they're, are they going to? Is the applicant going to run into problems there with 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 the house? And I sure. know you can't comment on something you hadn't seen, but I, it wouldn't right. surprise me if it comes back that way. Let's look at the elevation. So it's possible that two story form on top that um, is a two story stairwell. We would want that to be inset two feet. The part towards the back where the eave height's matching the eave height of the house. As long as those dormers were inset two feet, or, you know, the ground floor we could perhaps be okay, or the commission has approved in the past similar situations where that walls at the back, they kind of line up with the side walls of the house. So that's a possibility. Um, they are kind of at the minimum for the rear setback, so they're at five feet for the rear setback. Any less than that's not really feasible for kind of getting in and out, so. And that's not an alley back there. Is that it? is an alley. It is an alley. Yes. So, so the access they, to the garage is through is from the alley. So five foot has is the absolute. It's not like you could go three foot or something. Well, the commission can determine the setbacks. I th typically, staff has recommended no less than five when there is um, when the garage doors face the alley, just because mm -hmm. you, you kind of need enough room to turn in and out. I think public public works is weighed in on that one as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, if they were to go with that 20 foot in between if they have anything to play with there anyway just comment yeah. anything else commissioners okay 
Oh, great. Right. Uh, is the applicant here? No? Okay. Applicant's not here. Uh, public hearing is open and closed. So thus our discussion or a motion. Um, in terms of, we can't solve the, applicant's not here, so we, we can't solve the, the issue for him, but I, I think um, 24 feet, that park's a big vehicle. I mean, maybe it be up to them to take a few feet out of that and maybe a few feet out of the house and they'll get close. Um, and I feel certain that the staff could work with the applicant if, if the house gets a bit wider. There, there's some room to grow there and they don't have to necessarily cut the um, square footage out of what they, they'd like to put on the line. So with that said, I will um, move approval of the application with staff's recommendation and the further guidance that um, because of the five foot um, setback, minimum setback at the alley is, is, is how we would typically do that, that uh, the guidance would be given to the applicant to, to find their 20 feet somewhere else. There's a motion. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Okay. None opposed. The motion passes. Okay. 307 South 10th Street. The existing house at 307 South 10th Street does not contribute to the historic character of the overlay. Staff issued a demolition permit for the structure in December. This application is for the construction of a duplex structure with two outbuildings. South 10th Street marks the western boundary of the overlay. The subject lot is on the east side of 10th Street, and here's kind of a view looking up the street and one looking down. It's between Fatherland and Shelby Avenue. So you can see the entire east side of this block consists of non-contributing ranch houses. It was really rainy that day, so sorry the pictures are dark. It's been raining every day. Here's a view from the front yard of the property facing northwest. You can see a 1960s apartment building across the street there. Next to it's a large church that dates to the 1980s. And then on the right is the Fatherland Shops, which is two doors down from this site. The proposed setback of the new construction will be approximately 41 feet from the front property line, and this will place it in between the setback of the houses on either side, which is appropriate. The side and rear setbacks all meet the, ba the base zoning requirements. Here are the proposed front and rear elevations. The proposed height is approximately 30 feet from finished floor with eaves that are about 20 feet high. The width is about 33 feet at the front and it steps out to a maximum of about 40 feet at the back. So there is no nearby historic context. While the proposed infill will be larger than these non-contributing houses on the block, it's also consistent with the height of other nearby properties. The shops at Fatherland at the top here it was approved by the commission and constructed in 2015. In the middle is that 1960s apartment building across the street. And then in the next block, there's two recent condo developments and they're two and three stories tall. The commission approved those in 2015 and 2017. Staff finds that the height and scale are appropriate because there's no historic context and because the height and scale are comparable to other projects approved by the commission in this vicinity. Here are the side elevations. The proposed materials include lap siding and an architectural shingle roof. Staff should approve the final materials, including windows and doors, prior to purchase and installation. Moving on to the outbuildings. Uh, the applicant proposes two outbuildings with a total proposed footprint of 994 square feet, which is less than the 1,000 square foot maximum. Both outbuildings will have garage doors facing the alley. Outbuilding A will be two stories with an office upstairs. This will not be a dadu. The outbuildings will meet all the requirements for height, setbacks, materials, etc. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of the application with the following conditions. The finished floor height shall be kept low, consistent with the typical historic finished floor height to be verified by staff in the field. Staff will approve the final materials for the primary structure and the outbuildings prior to purchase and installation. Staff will approve the HVAC location and walkways will be provided from each unit to the sidewalk on South 10th Street. With these conditions, we find that the proposed infill and outbuildings meet the design guidelines. Thank Any you, questions for me? Okay, we might later. I know the applicant is here. Okay, applicant. 
not here. Okay. You're all right. The applicant is not here. Okay. Oh. <laughs> you could stand in for him if you like. Uh, oh, okay. So open, open public hearing, close public hearing. Um, Jenny has said that the applicant has agreed to the, to the uh, recommendation. Uh, so with that, discussion or? So motion? I'll make a motion that we approve 307 South 10th Street with uh, um, staff recommendations. Second. This motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. None opposed? The motion passes. All right, um, so this is for 1319 7th Avenue North. Um, the house located um, here is a single story residence that contributes to the Germantown Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay. The application is to construct an outbuilding that includes a dwelling unit. Um, and just first a little bit of a background. Um, for most of our overlays, um, the design guidelines include DADU standards that closely mirror those that are in the zoning code. Um, that's not the case with, uh, with Germantown, the Germantown guidelines um, as they were recently revised. Um, the reason for that is that um, most residentially used properties in Germantown are, are not zoned as our districts, which are one and two family residential, um, which permit DADUs with, with those conditions that are in the zoning code. Um, instead, in Germantown, most residential properties are actually zoned either a mixed use or an office residential zoning and category, which allow frequently multiple dwelling units uh, on a property. And in those cases, they're not considered uh, DADUs, um, so they wouldn't have to meet the DADU standards. Um, so as a result, um, the standards for reviewing outbuildings in Germantown um, reflect this difference um, in zoning and are different from the DADU standards in the zoning code. So this property um, is located on one of the few, if not only, blocks in Germantown that is zoned R6. Um, so uh, if, if I'm talking about standards that you're not familiar with, they're in the, the Germantown design guidelines, um, but they're, they may not reflect what we usually see that are, that's in the zoning code. So, um, so here we have the house, and then as proposed, the DADU um, is, is located at the rear of the lot. Um, the footprint and the setbacks um, meet the design guidelines for the Germantown overlay, uh, and the, vehicle, uh, the, the outbuilding will be accessed via the alley. Uh, at 20 feet 3 inches tall, the proposed DADU um, does exceed the height of the historic house by approximately 2 feet 9 inches uh, when measured um, per the, the italicized language in the design guidelines, which, which reads that outbuildings should not exceed the height of the principal house and goes on to, uh, to say that the principal building should be measured from the floor line to the ridge of the main massing of the house and the outbuilding should be measured from grade to ridge. So, so that's what staff used to, to, uh, to measure this. Um, so staff would recommend a condition that the overall height of the outbuilding when measured from grade not exceed the height of the house when measured from finished floor uh, to be consistent with and, and meet the, the design guidelines for Germantown. Um, so here are the left and the front facade of the proposed outbuilding. Um, the outbuilding's known materials as well as the knee height, or knee wall height um, meet the design guidelines. Um, and then the right and rear facades. Um, while uh, the Germantown guidelines do not reflect the, the dormer um, standards that we usually look at when um, looking at DADUs, the applicant has worked with staff to make sure that the dormers here do meet the, the DADU standards in the zoning code so that the outbuilding will read more as a one and a half story structure instead of a full two story structure behind the single story um, historic house. Um, so in conclusion, um, staff uh, recommends approval of the project uh, with two conditions. One, that uh, regarding the, the height of the house, that the overall height of the outbuilding uh, when measured from grade not exceed the height of the house when measured from finished floor. And two, that staff approve uh, the final details, dimensions, and materials uh, for the roof color, windows, doors, garage door, and driveway. So with these two conditions, uh, the proposed outbuilding would meet the Germantown guidelines.
So if you have questions, I'm more than happy. I know. Lisa, just a small edit. I, it was in the text, but sure. on your heading, it's 1319 7th Avenue North. Yes, it is. Um, and the top, it says sell on our packet. Oh, on the on the packet. Oh. That's just a small edit, just to make oh, it, okay. and since we've said my, it my verbally, apologies. it's Norse. Yes. <laughs> just, yeah, for clarification. And then also for me, um, sure. when I was reading through this the other day, because I, ha I, ha I haven't seen one of these with the Germantown, so with the difference between, so since most residentially used lots, you know, structures in Germantown are zoned that mixed use, right. you know, that is what the Germantown design guidelines reflect as far as outbuildings. And then the R designation, which this house is in, those have the applicable DADU ordinance, or does the design guideline over for the R, right. for the mixed use, overtake the DADU ordinance for the R use. Well, we did that we, make sense? I, I, like I understand, and, and that was that was <laughs> difficult for staff. This was like one of the okay. first cases where yes. we ran into this in Germantown. So yes, it's it's confusing. So in this case, we re, we review our guidelines. Um, how um, the the procedure that zoning will ask the you know they may say well historic approved it it's fine or they may have them go to the board of zoning appeals for variances I'm not sure okay. um, but that would be their call but so but the so you're saying but the way you address the way you analyze this was under as if it were a Germantown outbuilding in this mixed use. Well, and, and the base zoning, I, I just kind of put that background in there to kind of give a background as to why the Germantown design guidelines differ, for, a reason why they differ from the DADU standards. Um, so w it just looks at outbuildings. It does not differentiate their base zoning because we don't really review the base zoning. Uh, okay. Robin. Understood. So, but, but, so you're, but you did analyze it do to the design guidelines Correct. of Germantown. Okay. Correct. Just, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Sean. Okay. Is the applicant here? Yes. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. So there will be this, and you can just go forward and back. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hi, this is my confusing home. Um, my name is Kelly Williams. I live at 1319 7th Avenue North. Um, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to come today and talk about the complexities of this, um, for which I am not an expert. Don't really understand it fully myself. But um, I'm a Nashville native. Um, I work at Vanderbilt as an administrative assistant during the day. And at night, I make paintings. Um, and it's relevant in what I want to do with this building, but also in the reason why I'd like for it to be um, as large as I can get it, and to have the additional two feet of height um, that I'm asking for. Um, I purchased this home nine years ago, um, when things were a little different in Nashville. And this home sat on the market for close to two years before I came along, because it's technically a one bedroom, one bathroom home. Um, it's a modest, but somehow a large one bedroom, one bathroom home. Um, I, I just want to say I have no intention of leaving my home. And in fact, um, I'd like to make it, um, to get everything out of it that I'd like to have. Um, and I can do that in this building. Um, I would like to say that uh, this outbuilding would fulfill the need to get my art studio out of my home. And that is part of the reason why I'm asking for the footprint to be what it is, um, that it would allow me to have the most maximum space that I can possibly make my work. Um, and then the addition of the um, bedroom and bathroom on the top of the outbuilding would allow me to have some much needed living space. Um, as it is right now, uh, my mother cannot actually sleep in a bedroom because there's only one. Sometimes we fight about it, but um, that is the goal for this project. Um, it would allow me to do everything I need to do in one project in the most cost-effective way. Um, I just want to show you the context for this house. This is my neighbor to the left, a non-contributing two-story two duplex. 
This is my neighbor to the right, which is a contributing one-story duplex with an addition on the back um, that is 24 feet in height. This is a rear view of our homes on our block. Um, the addition to the left, again, is almost 24 feet. I verified that with the neighbor um, this week. And I also just want to point out the extreme grade um, and the slope of the backyards here. Uh, not only does the, this is from the alley, not only does it slope, uh, I guess that's south to north like that, but it also slopes um, east to west. So the backyard is um, sort of an uphill uh, drive. <laughs> um, uh, again, this is the two-story addition. Um, in the backyard, this is sort of taken from approximately where the dadu would be built. Um, and again, I just want to go back to this. Because of the grade of the yard and the extreme slope, the dadu would actually not sit above the ridge line of the current home. Um, so even though it is two feet, technically two feet taller, my home is just under 18 feet tall, um, it still would sit lower. Than the, than the existing home. Um, this is, these are the other two homes on the other side, both of which are two-story homes, non-contributing, but I just want to show you how, because of the slope of the yards and the street, everything does sort of appear to tower over. <laughs> um, and this is the view to the west. Um, this is... Um, this is, shows no immediate neighbors here, but I just want to point out that this parcel of land, which is actually the address is 1320 Rosa Parks Boulevard, is zoned commercial service. Um, this lot had a historical commission permit issued in 2014 for a new construction of a four-story apartment building, um, a retail apartment building, with a total of over 51,000 square feet planned. The building also had a proposed roof line of 46 feet and a parapet at 54 feet. Um, it also had an underground parking garage with ramps that connected directly to the alley, basically on the other side of the fence here. Um, so the plans for this building were purged last summer, um, but the parcel and the zoning um, would allow for the construction of a similar building. Um, so I just want to point out that I think that my yard and my property is the one that sort of sits directly across from this parcel. So if there were um, a neighbor there and it was a four-story building, it would directly, would change the way that this lot looks, I think, quite a bit. Um, this is just an interior slide of the floor plan of the house where it shows a one bedroom, one bathroom. Um, and then I also probably mistakenly just included a few interior shots of what an artist's studio looks like, um, especially when it's in the middle of your home. Um, and then this is what it looks like when it's not in your home next door. And then um, these are just a few of the dadus that are actually have been built on my block. Um, these two sit directly across the street from me. Um, they're both two-story constructions. Um, obviously non-contributing, they're recent homes that have been built. Um, this is one that's on Fifth Avenue North in the neighborhood. Again, a little bit, um, I think, I just want to say what I'm doing, I feel like, does contribute to the nature of my neighborhood. I don't think that what I'm proposing is out of line with my home or the neighborhood. Um, I think, uh, what I'd like to sort of summarize is just that um, this statue would sit 78 feet behind the front wall of my home. Um, the house, the house itself, a one-story house, is pretty minimal in height compared to some of the other one-story historic homes in my neighborhood. Um, the proposed outbuilding would not be visible from the front of the home, so the front of the home would look exactly like this. Um, and the historic features of my home would not be altered or obscured in any way by the proposed building. In fact, the home would remain untouched. Um, it doesn't have an addition on it, so it would be one of the only remaining, I think, intact historic homes in the neighborhood. Um, and um, I just <clears throat> want to say that I'm respectfully asking you for some grace and consideration just to grant me the two feet and nine inches. Um, it may seem like a relatively minor ask in relation to a building, but um, it has a huge impact on what I would be able to do with this building and what I'd be able to do with my house. Um, 
the garage, uh, building garage such as this and adding an addition onto my home to get another bedroom and bathroom is really not as cost prohibitive. Um, I simply couldn't do both. Um, but however, I could add a bedroom and a bathroom above the garage. It just requires a little headspace and um, in my family and in, for me, headspace is kind of a premium. Um, but you'd be giving me, me by this, approving this application as a much improved and healthier space to make my work um, and the ability to keep it separate from some much needed additional living quarters. Um, I just want to say thanks again and I appreciate your work so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Real quick, um, yep. I think you, did you say that, that um, because of the slope you're, you were actually not, do you have that verified? That yeah. Yeah, it's on this image. This is the submitted plan, um, but the architect that I've been working with is actually the architect who I bought this home from nine years ago. Um, so he did the remodel of the house footprint of the, the existing house, um, and he is the architect who I'm working with because I knew he knew everything about this house and this land. So um, he has verified that because of the slope and the grade and the backyard, the existing house would, the ridge line um, would still be taller than the data that we're proposing. Okay, thank it's you. It's a two foot, nine inch, yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Open public hearing? Close public hearing? Discussion? I have a question for Melissa just to make sure I don't, I'm not confusing, confusing the issue here. In the recommendation, is there, um, would the recommendation require a shortening of the application? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, based on the way the italicized language states that it should be measured. And that would be measured at the street, um, at the front facade? Right, well, it's, it states that the, the house is to be measured from finished floor while the outbuilding from grade. So you do have, if you... There's a delta it, there, potentially, depending on how right. flat slopes and everything else. Okay. Okay. Excuse me. I'm, I mean, just from the presentation, I, I understand, um, you know, M Melissa and, and following, you know, the guidelines um, in the italicized language to the T, um, uh, you know, with that slope and then just in this instance of this lot being, you know, surrounded by taller things and then the commercial uses in this neighborhood and, and just where it sits, the fact that with the slope, you know, the ridge line of the house is, you know, I guess had to be verified in the field, you know, is proposed to be at or below the roof of the existing house, um, whether or not technically that is taller from grade to, to ridge of the, the dadu, you know, um, that remains to be seen. but. As, as it states um, in for Melissa's wanting it two foot lower. So I, I just don't, with those conditions and, and this lot, um, you know, just the relative uh, modesty of the home and, and the dadu, in my opinion, I'm, I, I, I don't have uh, an issue with it as, um, as proposed. I feel the same way, but I just um, want to make sure that we, that it's like verified before and we're not going back having to, um, you know, ask for forgiveness later. I mean, I'm not insinuating you guys are saying that too, but that's the only, my only concern about allowing it because then if we do and, you know, well, now you're six inches over um, or whatever, um, and especially when we get away from what, you know, get away from what's written. I think I agree, Caitlin, with what you said. I, you know, on, on the eye test, at first glance, it, it is a modest house um, that is being preserved without an addition. Um, and I think that's meaningful um, in this in many cases. And it is uh, a modest outbuilding, relatively speaking, given the context of the neighborhood and the immediate context surrounding it, that um, it, it just is not one of those that um, I, I find issue with uh, in terms of height. I, I do think that the applicant has a little leeway here in terms of 
this appears to be, and yeah, from the drawings, this is a slab on grade construction. And so to the extent that they can get it in the ground as much as possible, I, I, I agree that it, it need not um, exceed the ridge line of the, the house sort of as a datum that no, no part of the addition um, should exceed that. And, and as much as it can be less than that, um, all the better would be, um, would be certainly uh, something that, that we could um, admonish the applicant and the contractor to, to do. I think also that the historic house is not being touched, so we are preserving that historic uh, feature, um, main feature. So um, that's, a, I think, a really good, good point. So, so if we modified the first condition, would we say, um, where would we say it would be measured from? Because um, we wouldn't say finished floor. I think if you established um, the datum as the peak of the existing roof. Peak of the existing roof, okay, okay. okay. Or, or may I make a suggestion, because um, you have drawings that show that, maybe just taking that condition out, not trying to reword it, but just take it out and say what, what they've presented. Okay, great. It's even better. Um, okay, I make a motion that we approve 1319 7th Avenue South. North. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sorry. I'm sorry. No, you're right. Sorry. You, you <laughs> made that correction before. I apologize, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, we make a motion that we approve 1319 7th Avenue North um, with staff recommendations, with the exception of recommendation number one, to be per the drawing submitted. There is a motion. Is there a second? A second. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? None. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Who's up? <laughs> 628 Shelby. <laughs> Mr. Paul. Can you um, switch back to ours? <clears throat> this is an application for info construction on this uh, vacant or soon to be vacant lot. As of last week, the uh, previous house was, uh, was still in place, but the commission approved its demolition in December. The proposed infill is a one and a half story, two family residence with a ridge height of 30 feet, three inches. Uh, it'll be 35 feet wide. Uh, these dimensions are within the range of historic building heights uh, and widths on this block, and the commission has approved infill over the last few years with similar dimensions. Um, one condition is that the site plan submitted does not include the adjacent contributing building staff requests as a condition of approval that a site plan be submitted, uh, revised to, to verify that street setback. The materials have all been approved in the past. Uh, the usual split face, split face block, fiber cement siding, and board and batten. Uh, each side of the house is drawn with this cantilevered uh, bay for a fireplace, a ventless fireplace. Those in the past have uh, been required to uh, have a foundation instead of being uh, floating there. So that's one condition uh, that staff requests as well. Photos for context. In conclusion, staff recommends approval with the conditions that the front setback matches the setback of the neighboring house uh, on the block uh, to be verified with a revised site plan, that the side bays have a foundation added, that the finished floor height is consistent with those of adjacent historic houses. Uh, staff approve rear porch materials, roofing color windows and doors, and that uh, HVAC and other utilities are located for minimal visibility. Staff finds that the application meets section 3B2 for new construction in the Edgefield Historic Preservation Zoning Overlay. And my applicant looks like that too. <laughs> Question, uh, questions. Happy to answer questions from the commission yep. or the applicant. If there are none questions for now, is the applicant here? Yeah. 
Okay. Kid, you, we want to hear from yeah, we want to hear from you. You've you waited so long. So, Let's hear. That's right. Will Jenner, 2610 Westwood Drive. Um, we're, we're fine with all the requirements, so we're good. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Open public hearing. Closed public hearing. Discussion or motion? Move no. approval with staff recommendation. Second. There's a motion. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. None opposed. The motion passes. Okay, 2809 27th Avenue South is currently a vacant lot. In 2017, MHZC approved the demo of the house previously on the lot. This application is to construct infill and an outbuilding on the lot. Um, just to kind of orient you, the commission has seen several projects on this block from the same applicant. Um, it's at the corner of Woodlawn and 27th Avenue South, you approved an addition, an outbuilding, then on a vacant lot you approved an infill, then two additions, and so this is kind of the last lot um, of that overall um, development. Um, I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly because staff um, doesn't have any new suggested changes and it's my understanding that the applicant is okay with all of the conditions. So um, here's a site plan showing the um, infill and the outbuilding. You'll notice that the house next door is set way far back um, in the back of the lot, uh, which is unusual, um, but this one will be closer to what the house on the other side is. And staff will obviously um, do a, um, Inspection to ensure that the front setback does meet the historic context. Um, here are the front and side elevations. The overall height and width are in keeping with the historic context. Um, the house is a little bit narrower, which allows for that side um, port cochere at the back of the house. Um, and it is deep, but it's a very deep lot, so staff found that that scale was appropriate. Um, you can see at the front, it's one and a half stories, and it's more like two at the back. There are a mix of, there are some two story houses. The one next door to it at the back of the lot is two stories, so staff found that the scale is appropriate. Oh, so that's the back and the other side. Uh, here is the two story. Um, garage at the back. It will not be a dad do because this area is zoned single family. Um, and staff found that a two-story was appropriate because the eave heights of the garage were um, less than the average eave heights of the uh, proposed infill. Here are some uh, context photos. This is actually, these were taken actually before any of the renovations happened. Um, I believe the addition at the top has already been constructed. Uh, and they're working on the one in the middle that, that's getting an addition. Um, there's a vacant lot with, where they're building a house, and here are some of the other existing houses on this block. So conclusion, staff recommends approval with the following conditions. The finished floor height be consistent with the finished floor height of adjacent historic structures. Staff approve the front setback. Staff approve the windows and doors, brick sample material, the front porch floor and steps, the roof shingle color, um, this one actually was, it says uh, a walkway be included. The, actual, the site plan does show a walkway, so we don't really need that condition, but you can keep it if you want because they are showing it. Um, and finally, that staff approved the HVAC location. With these conditions, staff finds that the project meets section 2B1 of the Hillsborough West End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay Design Guidelines. Happy to answer any questions, and the applicant is here. Okay, not at the moment. Applicant, please. Um, you want, okay. <laughs> the applicant chooses not to come forward. forward. <laughs> Open public hearing. Close public hearing. Discussion. Or motion. Motion to approve um, 2809 27th Avenue South with um, staff recommendations. There's a motion. Is there a second? A second. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. None opposed? It passes. Okay. We are on to 929 Montrose, which was pulled from the consent agenda. Um, this house is a little bit complicated, so I apologize if I take some time in explaining it. Um, so 929 Montrose is a pre-1908 folk Victorian house that contributes to the historic character of the Waverly Belmont Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. It is located at the corner of Montrose and 10th Avenue South. 
Um, the house has been altered at the rear over the last century. Sometime between 1957 and 1968, the former porch at the rear was enclosed and extended wider than the house. So you can see the wider portion um, in the Sanborn map from 1957, it, it's not wider, but in the 1968 black and white photograph, it is wider. Um, so today, the entire that entire back roof of the house is kind of a low sloped um, uh, shed roof form for the entire width of the house, and even extending a little bit wider. Um, and staff did indicate to the applicant that we would be supportive of bringing up and maybe hipping or, or yeah, you know, but changing that that roof form, and they are proposing to do that. So here are the proposed changes to the roof form on the left facade. Um, the red indicates the new roof form for the left part of the historic house, and on the side elevation, the blue roof form is kind of on the other side, like towards the um, right side of the house, like starting in the middle and going to the right. So um, staff is okay with these, um, the changes in this roof form, because particularly that part that extends wider, we know that that's not historic and find that the new roof form is compatible with the historic house's roof form. And um, also on this facade, just before I move on to the other facades, the applicant is planning to add window openings to the um, existing side extension, which again, staff finds to be appropriate because um, this part of the addition we know was built after 1957. Here is the Montrose, no, I'm sorry, the 10th Avenue South facade, uh, the right facade. Uh, again, you can see it right now, it kind of has that low slope shed roof at the back. Um, we think that that part of the house is actually has been extended or has been altered because the Sanborn map shows it as um, set in, but it's now flush with the house. So there's been a lot of changes to this house, which we don't 100% understand, but you know we have what we have. Um, so they're raising up that roof form to be um, still lower than the ridge of the house, um, but um, higher than it is now. And again, staff finds that to be appropriate because we didn't find that the shed reform was particularly important. Um, and found that the new roof forms do meet, um, are compatible with the historic house. Um, also on this part of the house, the applicant is adding a door and a window opening. Again, we think that this wall has been altered in some, some ways over the years, so we're, we're okay with those changes. Here is the site plan. The, um, the addition is meeting all base zoning setbacks. Um, this, once the addition is constructed, the applicant intends to use the front part of the house as one residential unit and the back of the house as another residential unit, so it will be a duplex. Um, because of that, they are adding walkways um, kind of from the parking area and also from the front street. Um, they are providing for four uncovered parking um, spaces at the rear. You can see here that on the right side, which is the side that faces 10th Avenue South, uh, the applicant is only intending to inset that portion of the addition by one foot six inches. Staff typically re recommends for a um, addition like of this size that it be in, inset at full two feet. Uh, on the right side, because that area is a, an existing addition, they're actually stepping it in much further, um, so it's a little bit in from what would have been the main wall of the historic house. Uh, making sure I didn't miss anything. All right, so here is the first floor plan and the left facade, uh, left, si left side facade. Um, the, the addition, as I mentioned earlier, will add a second residential unit behind the historic house. The applicant is proposing a two-story addition behind this one-story house. Because the lot slopes down towards the back of the lot, the applicant is able to step the floor line down of the addition, so the addition's ridge and eave height are just two feet lower, taller than, the, so um, staff, for the most part, finds that, you know, being two feet taller could be appropriate. The commission has approved such taller additions um, in the past. Um, but I'll explain a little bit um, some of the issues that we have with the um, with the addition. Um, so this addition, this facade that you're seeing right now is on the interior of the block. On this side, the addition steps in close to seven feet from the existing non-historic side addition. This new part of the addition is inset one foot from the line of the historic house. After a depth of four feet, the addition steps back out to line with the wall of the existing addition. This part of the addition will have a side gabled side-oriented gable in line with the existing addition and extend two feet taller. Um, so it's kind of complicated, but <laughs> um, in this case, the taller portion is, um, it's not necessarily two feet taller than the main ridge of the house on this facade. It's two feet taller than that exists, the new roof form that they're creating. And because that wasn't really a historic roof form, staff is fine with the height on this facade. 
Um, staff also finds that the materials for this addition are largely appropriate, except that the walls sh um, are shown to be clad with a 10 inch lap siding and the design guidelines say that the maximum um, reveal should be five inches. Uh, the commission in the past has approved wider siding than five inches as an accent material, but here we're finding that the material is being used as the primary material, so um, we would want the kind of the main primary material to be a lap siding with a five inch reveal, and maybe the 10 inch could be used um, as an accent other places. Here is the right facade. Um, this is the facade that faces 10th Avenue South. On this elevation, the addition insets just one foot six inches at the back corner of the house for a depth of four feet when it steps back out to line with the main right side wall of the historic house. Um, the two-story portion of this addition begins after the addition steps back out. So the two-story addition is not inset at all from the main wall of the house. Um, since the addition's eave and ridge height are over two feet taller than those of the historic house, staff finds that this taller portion of the addition should be inset a minimum of two feet on this side. This will keep the larger scale of the two-story addition from overwhelming the one-story historic house. So I'll kind of show what I mean here. So here is the... Um, the addition is seen from the front elevation. I think you guys can see it better on the screen than we can see it up here. Um, so staff is okay with this addition being taller on that side, um, but over here we're asking that the taller portion of the addition be inset two feet from the sidewalls just to kind of um, better differentiate those two elements and keep the overall scale intact. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about this. This is um, an addition we approved in September of 2018. Um, the applicant has asked us to include this because I think he wanted to use this as an example. So he will talk about that when it comes to his time. Um, so in conclusion, staff recommends approval of the project with the following conditions. The taller portion of the addition be inset two feet from the main side wall of the house on the right facade or Montrose, Montrose I'm sorry, 10th Avenue South elevation, that's a typo. Um, staff approve the final details, dimensions, and materials of all windows and doors. Staff approve the roof color, um, and staff approve the porch floor and step materials. And the primary uh, exterior cladding in addition shall have a ma maximum reveal of five inches rather than 10, and staff approve the HVAC location. Um, happy to answer any questions and or to re-explain what staff's recommendation is if there's some confusion. I have a general question about sure. reveals. Yes. Is there um, a guideline on percentage of the accent? I don't believe that there is one in this or any really of the um, design guidelines, except for maybe Germantown, which talks about the use of brick. Um, but so there hasn't, there isn't really a clear definition in the design guidelines as to what's an accent material versus what is a primary material. I mean, so. you not run into any issues with that where they'll say, well, it's an accent material, so we can do 50% of the building in this 10 inch reveal versus a five inch reveal. I don't know if we have come in. I don't, not that I'm aware of. I mean, it's come up where people have approved, we've approved it as an accent material. Sometimes it's not even like on the floor, but the first three or four feet of the house is a wider reveal and then it switches to <laughs> a um, thinner reveal. But yeah. Okay. So. Just, all right. You'll know an accent when you see it. <laughs> Can you, uh, I know Paris was included in, or is included in the application, um, 1005 Paris. There, I didn't see, no. Is there a, a floor, like a plan or site plan on the Paris um, inclusion in this application? No, but I could, if you give me 10 minutes, probably pull it up and get it on the I'm, screen. I'm just curious so. on the west elevation, I'm assuming where this is going. Does the, um, if we pull that, yeah, up. So the distance between the front historic portion of the house and the two-story piece in the back, does that middle ground set in? the two feet or some amount. The applicant or? might recall that better than I do. Okay. And again, I can, I'm happy to pull it up and try and get on the screen here in a few minutes. So. Sure. I'm just curious. And I, I think it may have something to do with yeah. <laughs> the discussion. Maybe not. Okay. Will the applicant please explain some things to us, please? Sure. <laughs> clicker, okay. um, I'm Martin Wick. I'm the architect. I'm at 912 Bailey Street. Um, since we're already talking about this, I'll go ahead and kind of segue between the two. Uh, this house, kind of similar to Montrose, is 
um, kind of a smaller Victorian that had a, something weird going on in the back a little bit. That center section um, in that bottom elevation is actually historic as well. Um, and it's close to flush. I can't, I think it might have been flush on the wall and then the roof stepped down a little bit. Um, when we originally looked at it, we had thought we would be able to uh, remove that portion as well, but that ended up staying. So I think it's, it's either flush or very close to flush all the way back on that elevation. And then when we get to the, the um, gable going the other direction, uh, we, I guess it probably stepped in just a little bit, but we stepped back out to the same um, plane as the, the front gable. Um, and it's included there because similar to what we're doing uh, at 929 Montrose, um, the eave height and ridge height are only about two feet different between the two. Um, and it's kind of getting into that gray area of where exactly is the transition between one story and two stories. Um, you know, the eaves is still below, or it's still kind of in the middle of the windows on Montrose, which I guess I can go back to that elevation um, here. And it's, it's just hard to kind of get a good definition of where exactly that transition happens. Um, but I wouldn't exactly call this two stories uh, looking at it here because we're really only stepping up two feet from the existing house. Obviously more of the height comes from the fact that the, the site slopes so much we're having to step down to that. Um, so that's, that's one of the, the reasons we sort of looked at keeping that flush um, as we went back. Uh, the other reason we're kind of trying to make a sort of more dynamic elevation here um, this is working, we're working with a developer on this and because of the neighborhood and sort of what they're trying to do to, with dif different projects there, you know, they want to try to maximize their, their footprint, what they can get out of, out of the, the project and um, in a lot of situations that leads you to pushing, you know, your walls all the way up against that setback and just going straight back with it. Um, we're kind of trying to, to create something here that uh, at least that, that gable is the same width as the front gable of the house. We're kind of, you know, using that um, to respond. I guess there's not, let's see. There's the front elevation there. Um, using that as sort of our response to, you know, where, where we're putting that gable there. Um, and then stepping back with the, the main massing of uh, the elevation, again, to go back on that back gable. Um, as Melissa said, we're working with a really unusual roof line here. Um, a lot of Victorians that you see around in, in neighborhoods will have these front gables that come off, but then as you get back to the main massing of the house, they'll kind of have a big hipped portion that gets a little bit taller. Um, with this one, for whatever reason on that addition, they just sort of knock the whole back off and put a big flat roof over it. So we don't have that height um, that a, a typical Victorian might. So we're going a little bit taller than the existing house because it is so short, um, but we are trying to keep our, our massing of the elevations, the, the roof slope, everything in line with the existing house to, to sort of respect what was there um, while also trying to, to modernize this lot. So if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer any. Um, the other recommendations on there, do you Oh, right. Agree with uh, all of them. Yeah, the, the five inch lap is fine. We're happy to, to switch that up. Um, as I've said, we've, we've done some projects where it kind of switches back and forth, but I would agree this is the bottom half of that elevation is definitely the major portion of it. Um, so we're happy to switch that back to the, the five inch. Thank you. Yeah. So, so is the condition number one that you're? I believe so. I can, you, you don't want the inset at all, or um, did you say? I mean, we are we have portions of it inset, and in, I believe the, de the description for a one-story addition on a one-story house is only to step in one foot. So, you know, it's again, it's that sort of gray area of where, where are we actually becoming two stories. We're only two feet taller than the existing house um, at both Eve and Ridge. Uh, obviously, the slope makes a big difference there, um, so it's... And you yep. did a foot, is that right? Yeah, it's, it's 18 were, inches on that okay. side. And then that one gable steps back out for, I think it's about 16 feet wide. And then the majority of the addition steps back in as well to that 16 inches the rest of the way back. Okay, thank you. Can, can sure. you point that out? 
Uh, does this have a laser? It's with a little. Yeah, use the pointer. Just, um, just so we're clear what we're talking about here. Okay. So that I think part. That we're talking about this step in here is the 18 inch step in this mm -hmm. line. And then this is where it steps back out to that gable. Um, so like the front of the house, we also have a small bay off of that side, but it doesn't have a, a foundation there. Um, but the, the larger gable that steps front or steps forward is I think the main contention, but it's also only 16 inches or 18 inches back past that. So if the two foot condition is held up, we'll have to step the entire wall back. That, that wall that's right. In, so in it's in, yeah, all, all of this elevation or the elevation that we're looking at right now, will have to step in um, more than what it is right now. And would likely end up being sort of a, even if it kept the roof forms, would end up being a, a flat elevation across that, that side. Is the other side uh, one foot or two foot? Um, so the, uh, both, both of the gables that we have drawn um, step back out to the existing plane on both sides. But the step in here, I think would, it was seven feet or close to that. And then the step in here is 18 inches. Mm -hmm. So I will just clarify that we are only asking for the answer of the two feet on the kind of on this facade, right. but not on this facade because the part that's taller is it's kind of confusing. Is this part right here? And so it's not really much taller than the house itself. It's just taller than the new roof form, if that makes sense. So we're okay with that. It's just we're asking for this part to two feet. So. And we also do have the other drawings for 1005 Paris. If you wanted to look at those and discuss them, we can bring them up. But if you feel like you have the information you need, it's up to you. So can you, um, I think, can we go one, one drawing forward? If I'm reading stipulation condition one, the three windows there are back two feet from as drawn. Is that accurate? Right, yes. Okay. And Based the on the condition. Would be six inches. Mm -hmm. so, that, so that, this form right there, yeah. <laughs> yeah this yeah. form right here, we, we are asking it to be pushed back two feet, and then this mm -hmm. part right here would be six inches back from where it is right now. Is the 18 inches acceptable in the hyphen between the two, the new and Typically the old? Typically, we would ask for two feet. Mm -hmm. um, it's not? Yeah. Okay. If um, the first and second floor, there's a, there's a sort of floor line or detail there, the lower right section, if we push the upper part back six inches, it would be six inches back from the lower section. It would sort of go just a little bit. I think I was envisioning that that whole wall, the whole plane would be set in six the, inches. The two together. The two together, yeah. Would come back two feet. Right. Okay. Well, I, no, I guess we wouldn't necessarily require that part to be back two feet from where it is now, just two feet back from the wall. So, I mean, that would be the, from our recommendations, it would be the architect's choice whether or not to move keep the kind of varying planes and push it all back two feet or to make the planes flush, flush and just, you know, or so that, that would flush. be, we would be fine with either mm -hmm. of those. Okay. Okay, oh, we're probably not, are we having more questions for the applicant? Yep. Okay, not for the moment. Okay. Open public hearing, closed public hearing discussion. This is not, um, well, I think it's germane to this discussion, but uh, the applicant sort of brought up and I, and I remember I think it was a case a couple a couple weeks ago there was a deputy what's what's there was some description given of a house that was in fact one story because of the way the window pattern was and there just wasn't the attic space wasn't developed and we were basing 
a discussion about one and two stories or one and a half stories on Eve height and stripping away from it the fact that there's windows that obviously indicate and, and, and that there's a, you know, a, a floor line, a really tall window and a really tall eave, those things kind of go together. If you do a really tall eave and then a really short door and short window and you put another window in there, that doesn't, architecturally, that that reads as two story. Those all, all those things kind of go together. And I, and I, in this case, I think if I put my hand in front of the left side, it looks like two stories on the back side, or at least one and a half. It's a rather tall knee wall. And, and, and so I, I think um, we can't, we don't analyze them necessarily that one is apart from the other because a historic home sort of allows this to happen. But I, I, I kind of, I don't separate those two things when I'm looking at it. This definitely looks like it's pushing the edge of a one and a half story um, with a, a knee wall that appears to be, you know, in the 48 to 60 inch, maybe more, depending on how it's constructed. Um, to speak to that, I, I think it, I will say it is typical of a two story um, that you'll have that distinction um, to separate those two things and it, it does affect the mass. I'll, I'll agree with staff that it certainly does affect the massing, whether it's appropriate in this in the particulars of this case, I'm open for further discussion amongst the commissioners. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Commissioner Mosley, and I don't see anything about this the slaughter development that that begs that they need that they can't you know follow the guidelines and and, and do as staffs recommended with the two feet. Um, especially since they're getting a lot more space kind of with the natural slope of the lot going down um, as opposed to the Paris lot actually went the other way. Um, we're just looking from the one photo in our staff report. So I don't, I just don't see a reason that it can't follow the guidelines due to this particular lot and what staff has recommended. Yeah, I recommend the solution for sure, but um, they, um, it seems like, you know, kind of agreeing with you that this is something they can probably make that work. So I don't see a lot of heartburn with it, but I do commend the solution, though, and the respect to the historic home. Okay. Lee or Elizabeth, any comments from you two? Good. All right. All right. Well, um, someone make a motion, please. Sure. Um, with regard to 929 Montrose Avenue, I recommend approval with all staff recommendations. There's, there's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. The motion passes. All right, we are at to revision to rules of order and procedure. There, you, you probably, I'm sure you've read it, so um, you'll see that there's multiple changes. I think most of them are fairly um, housekeeping issues and some of them are just to keep us in line with other boards and commissions. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have of that. Probably the biggest change though is on page 10 adding the possibility of a show cause hearing, mm -hmm. and that will allow staff to bring any violations to you, uh, require that they come to you um, as a, before they go to court. Mm -hmm. And our legal counsel can explain it better if you have any questions. Legal counsel, would you like to have any comments yes. on this? Okay. <laughs> um, sometimes we get questions about what do we do when someone does not comply with the order of this board. Um, and typically what we have done in the past is we've, we've brought people back to see whether or not the board will um, approve whatever changes or whatever action was taken not in compliance, whether that be in addition to something that uh, was previously approved or whether that would uh, be some other kind of change. Another way that we have addressed um, those kinds of issues when it comes to violations of this board's orders is taking them to court. Um, environmental court hears cases for the historic zoning commission as they come up um, with re regard to um, violations. 
This is another tool in the toolbox. The show cause hearing is an opportunity for this board to call persons back who have previously been granted permits by this um, by this board and require that the permit holder show cause as to why the board should not uh, revoke the permits previously granted because of violations of the um, of the conditions or failing to meet the conditions or adding things that were not previously approved. So it's another tool in the toolbox. It's a tool that has been used effectively by the Board of Zoning Appeals. Um, in the past, there have been situations where uh, people have not complied with the conditions that have been granted by the board, and the board has sought um, a way to require compliance. And one of those ways has been the show cause hearing and bringing the per person in, allowing them the opportunity to be heard as to why uh, they have not complied and, and uh, giving ear to any extenuating circumstances and giving weight to whatever evidence that they provide um, in making the determination as to whether they're gonna revoke a permit or not. Some instances they have revoked permits as a result of the show cause uh, order or the show cause hearing um, and having heard from the applicant um, at such. So this is, again, another tool in the toolbox that you all may, may want to utilize administratively as opposed to going through the court procedure um, to address violations. Ms. Oh. Jones, a uh, yes. question regard, just procedural question. Uh, if, without a show cause hearing, if an applicant has a valid permit and they violate that permit, um, and it's referred to environmental court, mm -hmm. are, is there a legal recourse that would prevent them from completing work or even applying for um, a certificate of occupancy if it were new construction, for example, mm -hmm. and, and then it, the violation is treated and isolated from itself so that they might get the benefit of use of their property mm -hmm. and still have a violation ongoing, whereas the show cause would revoke a permit and would open up other options to government to not allow a certificate of occupancy if there were no valid permit on the property. Uh, is that is that even we an had, issue here? You know what, I hadn't thought about, about it from that perspective, but that certainly is, I, I think, a, a valid way for, for it to be used. Um, hadn't thought, I just hadn't given it any thought from that perspective, but I think that's a, that's a valid point. It was a curiosity in, in mm -hmm. that if not that anybody would, that would, would appear before us who would do this, but if they didn't want to follow the rules yet, mm -hmm. wanted to get down the road and, and, and sort of utilize the legal system to mm -hmm. delay enforcement and or mm -hmm. whatever else, um, hope for the best, I don't, I don't know, that that, that would um, be an easier route perhaps than having a permit revoked and, and the property would sit and they would still be responsible for all the things that a property owner would be responsible for perhaps without use of the property. Yeah, they, um, it's, sometimes, you know, the permitting process involves different departments. Um, and so that's something that we need to, I, I guess we need to look at and, and explore maybe. Um, but again, this is this is just trying to give you as many tools as you possibly can have um, that it seems will. If it were interpted that way, it would be a little bit heavier hammer. Mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. it with. Mm -hmm. I think that's something we should consider. Okay. Yeah, on that. <laughs> Thank you for the idea. <laughs> yeah, adding on to that, I would have never thought of that um, off the hand. But adding on to that, so when an applicant comes to. Do, say they're on Broadway, for instance, and they go to pull a permit for an exterior modification. That the our historic zoning gets flagged, correct? Mm -hmm. Or codes flags it. Right. And so on their permitting system, it's all you know that online thing. Is there's a line item for historic preservation and if they got the permit or not, correct? And so everything has to be signed off when they go for their CO, correct? So yeah, I mean as of that, so if we revoked a permit mid-construction, for instance, would that then make, yeah, the, the, their permit for the entire project? You know, like they don't have that technical sign-off that you have to get from all the different departments. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have fire, water, you know, storm, mm -hmm. all that. Um, that. That's just an interesting, uh, I'm just thinking of it, looking at, you know, the computer screen of all the different codes that you have to have to mm -hmm. get your permits. And, and that's, a, that's a possible outcome. Um, sometimes we see projects um, that are out of compliance after it's gone through that. That would be the most effective time mm -hmm. to, to be able to do that. Um, 
But sometimes, unfortunately, we don't know about the violation perhaps until after the construction is complete and there are no more permits to be to be sought. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that case, we historically we have gone to court on those cases if we're unable to resolve them any other way. And we have quite a few cases right now that are waiting kind of in the queue um, for us to prosecute in environmental court but because of the, the docket being inundated with um, a number of things, including the short-term rental property cases, um, some of those we have not been able to push through um, in, in that fashion. But again, this will open up an opportunity for, and you honestly, you really already have that. I mean, I think kind of innate in a board's ability to grant a permit is the board's ability to revoke the permit if the conditions are not met under which the permit was granted. Mm -hmm. So I think you technically already have that ability to do a show cause hearing if you were to want to explore that. However, I think it's cleaner if you have it in your rules, that way everyone is on notice of what are the possibilities um, with regard to getting permits and not, not abide by them. I also think that deferrals, um, it's good to have a number on that um, because we, we're coming up on, we, we, you know, we, we've experienced several times where they keep deferring, 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 and um, we don't ever close it. Mm -hmm. um, that application stays open, right? Um, especially with the staff. Do you find that there's, uh, that is an issue of an applica application open because of a deferral? It has been lately. Um, usually, or, or sometimes when someone defers, it doesn't automatically come back the next month. But there have been situations where they have asked every month to come back, and every month at the last minute they defer, or request a deferral. Is that the difference? Is that the difference of the last, is, is that what the difference is with deferrals? Uh, the, I mean, the underline, is that new or is that yes. new? Yes. Right. The underline language is new, yes. Mm -hmm. And and we had some similar language in there as it related to withdrawals in the previous iteration of this, um, this document, but what we wanted to do was to um, spell out exactly what will happen as far as deferrals. Deferrals are kind of like... Um, they're kind of like continuances uh, in court. Um, you can request a continuance in court, but it's up to the judge as to whether you're granted one. Um, and, and likewise, in this tribunal, persons can request for their item once it is on the agenda to be deferred, but it's really up to the board as to whether or not you grant that deferral or not, because that would be an action of the board to defer an item. Um, so here, we put in some, some guidelines that hopefully will be helpful um, that really creates a situation where it's treated as a withdrawal if it is deferred mm -hmm. um, more that's than two right. times. Yeah, that's the difference. That's yeah. And, and then, then it goes on to kind of explain a little uh, more clearly what the effect of an, a withdrawal is, um, and it prevents you from um, applying with the same or similar application within the next six months. So. Hopefully that will give people opportunity to kind of go back to the drawing board and if they thought that they needed to withdraw or if it's not quite ready to have an opportunity to actually get it ready. Because as a, as a practical matter, when items are put on the agenda, then there are people that, that show up <laughs> expecting for that matter to be heard. Mm -hmm. And so if it is constantly put on the agenda month after month after month, then we really kind of may be in a position where we're inconveniencing the public, uh, thinking that they are gonna come down here, they're gonna have an opportunity to be heard, only to be told that the matter won't be heard at the request of the applicant. So I think this kind of makes it a, a more fair situation. You get two opportunities to without any um, any adverse effect and then after that if there's a third one then that will be treated as a withdrawal and we welcome any suggestions that the board may have with regard to their any comments you know that we find too that when you know it's it's good to I think address if the applicant has a good reason for a deferral so that if there is a request for a referral that we ask it we say why did the applicant defer if they didn't then perhaps then we are more aware to say all right let's you know let's review this this project so that we don't keep seeing it um, if it's reasonable. I mean, I, I feel like I find out more we want to def them to defer more than they want to, but we still, nothing has changed regarding that. We still have to wait for them. They have to request it. Um, procedurally on a deferral, and it's been 
noted here that, um, and the commission may grant, which means there's an action. And, and I know a lot of times there will at least be mention of it in terms of granting an action. What is the procedural, what do we need to be doing to make sure that we, we acknowledge, uh, do we need to be doing more than we have to acknowledge an applicant's request for deferral? Of course, it was mentioned uh, in, in the going over the agenda mm -hmm. today, which and then we took action on that. But in, if an applicant gets up and then in the middle, or uh, we've had them defer at, at some point because they didn't like, they didn't think they were going to win, but they can just apply the next time. And I, I, I've never, never mm -hmm. caught that one. And the same thing could happen here after two times. Just make another, you know, apply will. again. Uh, yeah. uh, and we can't. There's, there's nothing we can write here that would prevent them from applying. And they don't. There's not a fee, so I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how punitive that is necessarily. But I, I definitely agree that you can't deferring it forever is is not right. But back to my question is do. As a board, do we need to acknowledge in some way other than quizzing the applicant and taking an action? What, it, what does taking an action mean for us so that we follow the guidelines and rules? Very good question. Taking an action would be, mean take a vote, to take a vote on whether or not. So someone would need to move to defer and someone would need to second and then you would need to have a vote. Now you kind of do that already in your agenda adoption. So um, it, it, the note is made and, and the um, announcement is made to the board and then no, if no one has any objection to it, it, when you adopt the agenda, it includes your deferral as well. But if you, if you wanted to um, really uh, be as clean as possible, it would actually probably be a separate, um, separate action. And do right. we need to? Well, and, I, and right, and I think that's a good distinction. You know, you brought up whether or not it happens. You know, kind of in the middle of the hearing or not. And I think this this rule is really contemplating um, deferrals that occur prior to the hearing. Okay. That's that's what this G is really contemplating for it to be on the agenda and it's deferred and then it's on the agenda again and then it's deferred. It really is not contemplating the situation where there is a public hearing that's opened and then you get to your discussion point or even before the end and the um, the applicant sees that it may not go exactly as as they may have wished and they move to defer defer or ask the board to defer. And I think this does not change that part of it. Mm. Um, do you have anything to add, Robin, on that? Okay, I just want to, I don't know that we talked about that specifically, so I wanted to make sure that. And it would seem to me, and I, I may be, this may not, I may not need to worry about this, but I, I think we should acknowledge that the applicant has chosen to defer because if, if we just say a deferral and somehow it looks like we did it, then it reverts back to, we, we, we didn't hear it in the amount of time and it's an automatic approval. I, I, I would. It would be good to get all of that information yeah. in the record. I agree sure. with you. Yeah. But we can't. We can't defer it. I, I think just no, acknowledging no. that the applicant has chosen to defer is, is the way it ought to be talked about. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, went through staff to defer it mm -hmm. uh, and not us. I mean, right. every transparency is always good for public. Right, um, absolutely. For public hearing. And then just one other thing, the 3D, remove, play at page one, the removal of members, was that never a, that was that never, that was never a stipulation for that? It was just a, you would, re, you would uh, resign yourself voluntarily? That was the only way? We, we didn't have a rule that okay. dealt with that. And okay. so what we did was we took our cues from what was already in the, in the Metro Code um, as it relates to removal of, um, of persons. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we took that and, and came up with a rule that would we hope would be suitable for the board um, in the event that we have members that were unable to make it. Um, sometimes we know that um, when the appointments come, um, everyone is excited to be a part of this board because it's a great board to be a part of and it's an opportunity to make a difference in the city. But sometimes things arise that are with, outside of our control or people's lives change or people move or jobs change and, and things like that happen. So we want to um, um, encourage, though, people to think about when they're absent, what happens. Um, and the work continues, and, and we need you all to be able to be here to do the work because many of you are taking off of work or you're making some of the sacrifices in order to be here. So in an, in an effort to be fair to everybody who is making the time sacrifice, um, if a person is not able to be there, we, we really need to get someone who is.
And, and it affects quorum as well. So if they're waiting until the very last minute and then you've got applicants, it does affect the application process. Absolutely. So, um, mm -hmm. I think there's some, you know, levels to that decision to, to create this uh, new um, members and duties. So Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's a, a good one. And, and we're we're all public service. You're right. <laughs> you know, this is mm -hmm. we're giving of our generous time and Absolutely. And, um, and we appreciate know. it. Yeah. We we all appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Man. Oh, anything else? No, I don't have anything else. Okay, we, we <laughs> shall adjourn. Matt, Matt we have to, we have to oh, oh, right, yes, yes. If, if you would. Oh, yeah, we got to do this. <laughs> Before you adjourn. Oh, yes. Okay. But also, um, if you would also include whoever makes the motion, if you would include also for us to have uh, for the approval, obviously as recommended by staff and, and the legal department, but also to include in there that we would be able to make any non-substantive type Graphical changes that may need to be made as a result. Um, I, there's a couple, I think, in here that we've now identified, and we'd like to be able to make that without bringing it back to the board because they're non-substantive changes. Okay. So, Madam Chair, I'll move approval of the uh, alterations to rules of order and procedure per the staff recommendation with the um, additional stipulation that grammatical errors and other non-substantive changes be at the discretion of uh, Staff and, and um, legal. Second. Yeah. Is there a second? No, second? Okay. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. All right. We are all approval of this addition. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are adjourned. Can I remind you of one quick little thing? Yeah. It's not a part of the meeting, but just wanted to remind you about the old house fair, March 2nd, uh, 9 to 3 p.m. at Severe Park Community Center. And um, it, we're still having a little trouble with our, our direct website, but if you just Google Old House Fair of Nashville, you'll, it'll get you right there. And you can see all the different exhibitors who are gonna be there and the sponsors who are uh, making the event possible. And there's a list of quick little presentations that'll be throughout the day as well. So hope we'll see you there. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.